the meeting of Central Board of Health, Monday, October 15th, Selectman Chambers, uh, Town Hall, 6 p.m. Motion. Oh, no. <laughs> motion. Yeah. Yeah. Make a motion. <laughs> Seconds? All in favor? Aye. Okay, schedule items. Discuss wind term with David Darda. Darda. Darda, okay. You want us to come forward? Sure. Or? Just come forward, state your name, sure. uh, addresses. Sure. Okay. My name is David Darty. I live at 122 Gilson Road. Beside me, Mr. James Rosenblum of Cine Associates. Good evening. In September of 2012, I appeared before this board with a group of residents who were suffering from the effects of a wind turbine that was located too close to their homes. At that meeting, the board was given a petition signed by 20 residents stating their complaints and symptoms and requesting that the Board of Health provide them with the relief from the wind turbine that they sought. The board deliberated and in response, they ordered that a noise testing program be performed in accordance with the state DEP noise regulation. The results of those tests showed no violation to the current law. And the complaints have continued to this day and the residents of this town have continued to suffer. Because of a noise regulation that was written that never considered the unique noise generated by wind turbines, the absence of any law controlling shadow flicker, infrasound, and amplitude modulation, our community lives under the threat of further health issues from future wind turbines as well as existing ones. This problem with wind energy conversion systems that are located too close to residential property is not unique to situate. It occurs worldwide, countrywide, as close to our neighbors as Kingston, Fairhaven, and Falmouth. Many other communities such as Bourne have had the foresight to adopt health regulations to protect their residents from the pernicious effects of large wind turbines. Tonight, I have submitted to you a proposed health regulation, which is suitable for your review, modification, and adoption. A regulation that, if adopted, would provide the protection to the residents of this community that they require and deserve. This evening, Mr. James Rosenblum of Senny Associates and I will explain the dangers and health risks associated with wind turbines and explore the means by which this board can adopt a regulation that will protect the residents of situate from future and current health risks. Mr. Rosenblum's law firm was intimately involved in the court-ordered shutdown of the wind turbines in Falmouth. This action was based on the grounds of nuisance, and it was his office that provided the basis for the compiled noise regulation for wind energy conversion systems that I gave to this board for their review and adoption. I want to present to you Mr. James Rosenblum. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Dave, and um, so thank you for uh, having me here to uh, present to you. Um, as Dave already mentioned, um, our law firm was involved in the Falmouth turbines. Um, so I, w I wanted to present briefly on um, four topics based on my experience um, uh, dealing with wind turbines. Uh, first, just a general overview of wind turbine sound. Um, and uh, then a little bit of talk about some peer-reviewed studies in the area of wind turbines. Um, then a little bit on my own experience as counsel to some of the affected residents in Falmouth. And finally, uh, a little bit on the overview of uh, Massachusetts general laws as pertains to boards of health. Um, in general, wind turbine sound has a character that's it's broadband. It goes from the very low frequencies to very high frequencies. Most of the sound energy of a wind turbine is focused on the lower frequencies. This includes the infrasonic uh, frequencies from 0 hertz to 20 hertz that uh, at normal, um, normally is inaudible to the human ear, as well as 20 hertz to 200 or 500 hertz, which is still low frequency sound, uh, but is audible. Um, generally, wind turbine sound has a whooshing or pulsing sound. And the sound is, uh, we call it the, the blade passage frequency, how frequently the sound occurs. Um, talk a little bit later in the peer-reviewed studies, um, but they found that wind turbine sound, of all the kinds of environmental noise, save for um, 
shunting yards. Uh, it's, more, it's found to be more annoying than um, aircraft, railways, road traffic, and industry environmental noises. Uh, perhaps due to the, the character of it being low frequency and having amplitude modulation and the whooshing kind of sound. Um, ideally, we want to uh, set wind turbines back enough from residents so that the residents are not bothered. And to kind of give you a sense of how far you need to set it back, um, I uh, just just as a ballpark, I took from uh, Dr. McHoney's um, 2000 was it 2009 paper? Yeah. Um, a, uh, a chart, and if, if it's all right, I'd brought copies for the members of them. So you can see on this chart in the upper right-hand corner of the page that um, if you were to try to achieve a 40 decibel dBA on the A-weighted scale, um, sound at a certain distance it depends on the what's called the sound power level of a turbine. Um, most industrial turbines you'll find are somewhere between 100 and 100 or 102 and 110 dBA sound power level. Um, for comparison, the turbines in Falmouth were rated by the company at 103 dBA, but their maximum sound power level, according to the manufacturer, was 110 dBA. Uh, looking at this chart, if you had 108 uh, DBA, you would have to set back uh, the turbine from a residence over 800 meters in order to achieve that 40 decibels at the at the residence. Um, if you were if you had a, a less powerful turbine at 104 dBA, you would want to set it back five to 600 meters in order to achieve 40 decibels at the residence, and 106 dBA, you'd want to set it back close to 700 meters. Um, a little bit more about the. Um, the low frequency sound of a wind turbine. Um, 20 hertz is commonly recognized as the lower threshold of human hearing. Um, that is, you can't hear sounds uh, below that frequency, but um, they, you can perceive them. And uh, according to the scientific research, there are four possible um, ways why, why you might be able to detect them even if you can't hear them. And these include uh, hair cells of the cochlea, hair cells of the vestibular system, um, hair cells of the vestibular system after its fluid dynamics have been um, disrupted by infrasound and um, visceral graviceptors acting as vibration sensors. Those are the terms that I don't profess to have a great degree of um, knowledge of as they're more medical terms, but that's what uh, at least some proposed uh, mechanisms for how the wind tur turbine sound below 20 hertz is felt. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about my own experience representing um, people affected by wind turbines and what their common sense descriptions of how that felt uh, were. Um, another characteristic of um, wind turbine sound, uh, amplitude mod modulation, which is a, an oscillation in sound level, where it goes whoo, whoo. When, it, when it whooshes, the sound pressures, the sound uh, pressures drastically increase, and then they quickly drop off and drastically increase increase then to quickly drop off. This creates uh, amplitude mod modulation, which can be um, highly annoying for people that are exposed to it near wind turbines. Um, and annoyance, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that as a health outcome um, a little bit later. Um, the measurements of low frequency sound and, and amplitude modulations can be made with microphones specifically designed to capture uh, sound between zero hertz and say 500 hertz, a special infrasonic microphone can capture these and a, a sound engineer trained in this can, can map it out for you. What we found in Falmouth was um, when taking infrasonic measurements near wind turbine, um, that there was a correspondence with the blade passage frequency of the, of the turbine. So if it passes every one second, for example, you would find multiples of that, like one and two and three so on in the uh, in the measurements of the of the sound between zero and twenty hertz um, taken with the, with a microphone that kind of gives a um, a fingerprint as a, as you will so you know that the infrasound is not coming from your refrigerator it's not coming from the the highway it's coming from the wind turbine because it has that same uh, blade passage rate and all the um, all the multiples of it uh, present in the signature. Um, so the typical way to assess wind turbine negative health outcomes is through epidemiological studies. 
Um, as you may be aware, the studies are largely observational. You can give questionnaires to people who reside uh, near wind turbines and assess their health outcomes based on the questions you, you asked. Um, there are obviously uh, inherent limitations in epidemiological studies, but um, it's basically concluded that it's probably the best way to study uh, the health outcomes for uh, for people living near wind turbines, uh, despite the you know the limitations of the method. Um, so I wanted to run through just a few of uh, the peer-reviewed scientific studies, epidemiological studies that have been done worldwide um, for wind turbines. Um, in Sweden and the Netherlands, there have been a number of studies uh, conducted by Peterson and and other researchers such as uh, Peterson and Way. Um, throughout these studies, there is a statistically significant association between um, wind turbine sound power level and annoyance. That is, when the sound power level increases, annoyance increases. Um, that's pretty much steady held through many of the studies. Um, also reported in the studies was sleep disturbance, and this is statistically um, significant correlation above 45, when you get above 45 decibels of sound. And every 2.5 decibels you increase uh, shows another statistical uh, increase in sleep disturbance uh, correlation. Um, other studies by Peterson and Way uh, also find a significant association between um, wind turbine and annoyance, and they also find uh, self-reported stress uh, rises as does sound power level with the wind turbines. Um, the road traffic noise, uh, according to the studies, doesn't ha really have an effect on the annoyance from wind turbines and vice versa. If you're annoyed by wind, tur wind turbine noise, you won't necessarily be annoyed by traffic and vice versa. Um, I think fr from my experience in, in Falmouth, one possible reason for this is that traffic uh, sound does contain infrasound and it does contain sound in the lower frequencies. But it does; it lacks the uh, the same qualities as a wind turbine sound, which is amplitude modulation at a regular interval, like whoosh, whoosh. Where traffic noise can be more um, spaced out continuously. Um, when we measure sound, we measure um, sound. The the common a common way to weight is is called a weighted uh, sound measurement, which is is weighted across the uh, the spectrum of sound. Um, Dave can talk more about this, but. Um, the uh, C-weighted C is perhaps a better way to describe wind turbine sound. Um, one consequence of this is that whenever you're drafting a regulation or a bylaw about wind turbine noise, you want to you keep that in mind. And um, you want to keep in mind that the level of increase above an ambient uh, sound level based on A-weighted um, probably should be lower for wind turbine sound if you're, if you're talking about A-weighted than it would be for a continuous noise source like a, source like a very um, loud air conditioner or something. Um, in Falmouth, we, we saw this because in 2013, when the town passed their um, updated bylaw about wind energy conversion systems, um, instead of adopting the 10 decibels above ambient standard used by the Department of Environmental Protection, um, they adopted a six decibels above ambient. And they used A-weighted because A-weighted is, is more common and more easy to measure. Um, but they used six instead of, instead of 10 there. Um, let's see, some other... Um, peer-reviewed studies. Uh, Shepard et al. conducted a study in the South Makara Valley in New Zealand um, rate, rating the um, health-related quality of life indices. And they asked questions of uh, people within eight kilometers of wind turbines. How's your quality of life? How's your sleep? How's your health? Et cetera, th things like this. Um, the results of that um, study were that residents living within two kilometers of a wind turbine farm in New Zealand reported lower mean physical uh, quality of life scores, including lower subscores for sleep quality and reported energy levels. Um, and uh, another study in Poland by, very hard to pronounce the name, Polisic Luskryska et al. Um, wind turbine no noise was uh, reported as being more annoying than other environmental noises. And this <coughs> mirrors the, the research of, of Peterson et al. Uh, that describes that. Um, other reading that I might recommend, um, Nissenbaum, Armini, and Hanning, uh, in the Journal of Noise and Health, 2012, Effects of Industrial Wind Turbine Noise on Sleep and Health. Um, I've brought for the board um, the bibliography from a 2014 article. Um, and I've highlighted in here some of the uh, studies, such as the Peterson ones that I've just mentioned. 
that might be illuminating. And um, it's, it's definitely it's a topic that has had a lot of research poured into it, both by opponents of wind turbines and supporters of wind turbines. Um, as you know, wind turbines can provide a significant uh, benefit in the terms of uh, renewable energy, but um, there can be a cost if you place them too close to residents. Um, in my experience in Falmouth, uh, representing some clients that were affected by the wind turbines, um, some of the symptoms that were experienced by, by those residents included, um, obviously, annoyance, but also uh, pressure in the chest, constant feeling of anxiety, sleep disturbance, confusion, dizziness, um, and then it began to, for some residents, even bleed into uh, problems at work, including uh, dropping tools during work where this had never previously happened. Um, in one case, uh, there was a near mid-air collision event for an air traffic controller that um, ultimately led this person to conclude that he shouldn't be working anymore. So, uh, especially when you have a long-term uh, problem of sleep disturbance because the wind turbine is, is near, it can then kind of spiral and create other uh, health effects. And, and a, a lot of the, the studies do show, I, I've kind of mentioned that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the World Health Organization and sleep guidelines. Um, the World Health Organization has said that for all sources of noise, not just wind turbines, um, above 45 dBA decibels on the A-weighted scale, uh, sleep significant sleep disturbance begins to occur. Um, in the 2009 Night Noise Guidelines for Europe, uh, published by the WHO, um, it was stated that even at under 45 decibels uh, on the A-weighted scale, there can be substantial effects on sleep and the corresponding adverse health effects. Um, from the study in which I um, handed out the bibliography, uh, it stated that, uh, quote, impaired sleep is a plausible pathway, pathway by which wind turbine noise exposure may impact both psychological well-being and physical health. Um, yes, I think I mentioned as well th that, oh, okay, this is another study by Shepard et al. found the, the uh, linkage as well between uh, sleep disturbance and uh, being close to wind turbines. Um, Backer et al., uh, all these are cited by the way in the uh, bibliography there. Backer et al. is another study that found this correlation between sleep disturbance and being close to a wind turbine. Um, and a quote from the uh, uh, this study which I gave to you, um, the bibliography is from, quote, across the reviewed studies, it seems that sleep disruption was associated with sound level exposure. Um, so why does this matter? Um, obviously, if people are having health problems, that's, that's, well, I've been asked to kind of come and talk about that a little bit. Uh, the, the World Health Organization uh, defined annoyance in this case as not just uh, some small thing, but actually um, a negative health outcome. Um, and the inclusion of it as a negative health outcome by the World Health Organization, along with stuff like cardiovascular disease and uh, widely recognized serious uh, health problems, um, does kind of legitimize it as a primary health outcome in terms of environmental and noise research. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the weighted sound, and if Mr. Darty wants to I expound upon that, um, that's, that's fine as well. Uh, shadow flicker is another thing I wanted to mention. Um, before I got involved in wind turbine uh, representation, I, I didn't know what shadow flicker was. It's basically when the, the blades of the turbine are in front of the sun, and it creates a kind of strobe effect inside the house where for half an hour or an hour or two hours or several hours, depending on uh, the season, the, uh, the time of day, uh, you might have a strobe effect in your house. And it can be very disorienting to have that. Um, fortunately, shadow flicker is sometimes able to be mitigated by turning the turbine off during certain hours, during certain times of year. Um, and unlike wind turbine sound, um, this may affect some people that are close to wind turbines and not others, depending on the placement of a home relative to the wind turbine. Um, lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about the, um, the Massachusetts general laws as, as it pertains to boards of health. Um, as you probably know, boards of health have the power to enact reasonable, reasonable health regulations under uh, chapter uh, 111, section 31. Uh, they have the power to uh, regulate uh, nuisances under uh, section 122 of the same chapter. 
And uh, under 125, they have uh, the power to abate nuisances, um, to cause the removal of the nuisance. Uh, in such a case, the expenses occurred, incurred are considered a debt to the town and may be recover and are recoverable from the owner of the turbine in an action of contract. Um, a lien may also be imposed um, if such a debt is incurred. So uh, that's, that's about all I have for today, but um, I, I believe Mr. Darty would like to talk as well. And if at the end, if there are any questions that I'm able to answer, I'm very happy to try to do so. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you should have a copy of this proposed uh, regulation that I gave to Joan. Yep. What I'd like to do, I think after Mr. Rosenblum has touched upon some of the technical aspects of it, but they're in essence are the, the, the heart of it all, of this regulation. So what I'd like to do is, is touch upon them as, as lightly as I can. I know you don't want to sit here all night and listen to this, so I'll try and be brief. If we turn to the third page, where we've got the section five, performance standards. Now, I hope you'll excuse my crude representation of a wind turbine, but it is to scale, and it represents a 400-foot high turbine, as the one that's in town, to the tip of the blade. And because it's a scale, this is a house about 30 by 24. And if we look at this distance, that being 400 feet, the closest home is about 600 feet. So that, in essence, is where that sits. And you can see if you were to lie the thing down, how close it comes to the house. Anyway, the first section of this says performance standards, the WECS, the wind energy conversion system shall comply with the following standards. These performance standards to exist to all turbines operating and new ones to be erected afterwards. Location. <clears throat> in the, in the, in the uh, specification, we say the WECS with a capacity of 1.4 megawatts or larger. To give you some idea of this, situates is 1.5. So situates would be applicable in this shall not be permitted to be located any closer than 1,000 feet from the nearest residential home or a distance equal to less than three times the height. So in this case, if we took 1,000 feet, would be closest, but we go further by saying three times 400, which is 1,200 feet. And I might say, aha, this is a big distance. But not when you consider that the Cape Cod Commission has adopted 10 times the rotor diameter and the rotor diameter, this is 287 feet, so we're talking 2,700 feet if we were to go by the Cape Cod to, uh, code. The town of Brewster has enacted 3,280 feet being the closest. Charleston, Massachusetts, 2,100 feet. If you go international, Finland is two kilometers, is 6,500. Germany, 3,200. Poland, 7,000. And even our northern neighbors, Quebec, the minimum distance is 6,462 feet. So this regulation, at best, is a rather minimal compared to what had been enacted by other towns and boards. Now, it's my understanding, too, that back when the vetting process came in and they were going to put the turbine in town, General Electric was the turbine of choice. But they found out GE wouldn't sell it to them because there was a house within 600 feet of the site, and they wouldn't put the turbine in, so they went to China and got a Cineval. So even our domestic uh, manufacturers know enough to put these things far away from home so they don't impact them. Now, B, noise. You note that the first clause says, no WCS shall produce an A-weighted sound exceeding that allowed by the DEP policies. That's in there because one of the regulations this Board of Health has, it's my understanding, and Mr. Rosenblum could correct me if I'm wrong, you can't enact a health regulation that's less stringent than what is now currently available in the state. And the Mass DEP policy, the noise policy 7.10, is the only, the only legislation in controlling in this state that controls wind turbines. And it only has to do with noise that you'll see doesn't take into AM, amplitude modulation. It doesn't talk about shadow flicker. It doesn't talk about infrasound. None of those other items. It's like it's an open world out there for whoever wants to impact its residents. 
It says in here in the daytime, our broadband sound level should not be any higher than 6 dBA. Now, aha, dBA, what's dBA? Well, Mr. Rosenblum touched upon that. That is the audible sound that the human ear can hear. If we look at a, a graph, if this is 20,000 hertz up here, and this is down to one hertz, this line is the sensitivity of the human ear. And as you can see, around 1,000 is about the prime where we hear most of our sounds. And it goes out, it starts to drop off around 10,000, but then it takes a nose drop around 10,000 down to here, down to, down to one hertz. So when you measure sound, the DEP has set up this criteria that they're only interested in what the ear hears. So they only set the meter so the meter only listens to the sounds in this range, in this frequency range, in here. They ignore anywhere in this area, in here. Or they actually hear it, but they put very, very little weight to it because the ear wouldn't hear it. So what we miss in here is infrasound. That's this area in here from 10 hertz down, 20 hertz down, right down in there. But we'll get that in a minute. So the A-weighted, and this primarily goes, coincides with the mass DEP regulation, where they talk about DBA, and they talk about ambient, above ambient, ambient being defined as the low background. If you turn on off the wind, wind turbines and you want to hear how quiet is it before the turbine starts, that's background ambient. They say six decibels A-weighted above the ambient. Can't get any higher than that with a cap of 55 dBA during the daytime and the same dBA at night, but a cap of 40. And Mr. Rosenblum had touched upon that, that the studies show that anything above that produces a lot of uh, health issues among the people close by it. The next thing, pure tone. That really, that's also in the, 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 D, the DEP, mass DEP regulations. And pure tone is, is defined as a solid tone, one frequency such as B, but we're not too concerned about that here, it's the AM we're looking at. But that only mimics what the Department of Environmental Protection has. Next page and C. And here we get to the heart of the problem, modulation. This thing, the wind's blowing from this direction. It's turned clowns clockwise like this. And this thing sets up noise. Now there's a normal noise that's heard from the turbine in here, the sign whine of the turbine, and blade movement, and wind, and all that stuff. And that is the sound that the DEP listens for. What they miss is this thing called amplitude modulation. When these blades pass in front of that tower, they set up a, a, a wavelength in here, a pressure. And that pressure goes whoosh, 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 like that. And that impulsive noise is what gets people living around it, like myself, like some of the people in this are listening to this. If it were just a steady sound, we might be able to get used to it, <coughs> even though it sounds like the airplane that never goes away. But that impulse sound. Now, that graph, let's look at this on a graph. Here we have, this is an actual recording of the sound that was taken in Falmouth, Massachusetts. This is the decibel level, down to 34, goes up to 46. And this is the time. You can see it's in increments of seconds. Now, what the DEP regulations, and again, the only controlling law for wind turbines, says they have to do is set the meter to measure slow response. There are two ways that that meter in the industry listens for sound. It, takes us, it, it listens and it makes a slow recording. It only picks up the sound in a very slow manner or makes a quick response. And the slow is what the DEP asks, and that's in red. And you can see this is the sound wave. The whoosh, whoosh, whoosh going up, and the lowest part of it is about 39 decibels and the highest is 41. We have two decibels difference from when the turbine makes its normal noise, because that's the normal noise down there of all of the, 
the wine and whatnot, and then it shoots up for the, for the whoosh, whoosh. But if we take the fast reading, and that's what our regulations have, matter of fact, the DEP is, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. You can see that it goes from 37 up to 44. We have seven, it goes whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And I have a recording of that, so you can hear it. Music play motor. That's what amplitude modulation is, and that, it's like a jackhammer, the sound of a jackhammer, but much more pernicious, I should say. It, it, it just creeps up on you. And then I'll get into it in a minute. The infrasound sends out also, when this blade passes in here, that wave is sent out in a noise form of infrasound from 20 hertz lower, so you can't hear it but you can feel it, you can feel it. So what we've done here in the modulation, instead of worrying about what we say A-weighted sound pressure, again, we still do it by what we can hear, shall not exceed 4 dBA peak to trough. So instead of worrying about, oh, does that background noise, when we, when we take the background reading, instead of saying, oh, there's a car going by, oh, that's not really background, or the turbine owner is cheating or something. We forget about what the background level is, and what we do is, because we're looking for modulation, we measure from the trough to the peak to see the actual amount of noise that's produced on top of what the turbine's doing. Now, if you look at the slow reading that the DEP has, you get that peak to trough of only a couple of dBA. But in actuality, because you get the meter set for fast and it can discern the difference, because at the peak, you can get seven. It's a, it's, it's a big difference, trust me, when you're trying to sleep. <laughs> so we put four decibels is the limit. And we put A-weighted Fast, see it says fast waveform, eight, second, eight samples per second. This is all necessary to catch that peak. Whereas the DEP regulations, what they do is they do is a thing called LEQ. What they do is they average this. They average that and of course they come up with a straight line in the middle and they miss all the peaks. Now, they, I don't think in good faith the DEP was meant to be deceptive and to hurt people. Just for some reason they drag in their feet on trying to modify the regulations to properly evaluate amplitude modulation. They had a conference all summer long in 2012 with a panel of experts. They came up with all of these fine recommendations, this peak to trough, fast metering. They even had a conference, a, 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 a session where they said this is what we should do to find amplitude modulation. Uh, one of the people who has sat on that panel who agreed to this is the current principal of Epsilon that has a contract to testing right now. But he has to test by the, by the state codes which don't catch that amplitude modulation. So it's why essential we have to do that because the state hasn't done it and they've had six and a half years to do it so God knows why they're not doing it but who knows. So that modulation is very, very important. Infrasound, as I pointed out to you, that, that pulsation in the lower range that actually feels it. Mr. Rosenblum touched upon that, but there are also other studies, I should have brought you a copy, about a thing called vibroacoustical disease, where places in Germany where people have been subjected to this infrasound, they've actually had the, the, the cellular structure of their heart muscle change because of this pulsating. Again, not only are you talking to an advocate for this, but somebody who suffers this many times a year, I can feel 
that infrasound because it penetrates. It not goes through structures, through windows, through buildings. It penetrates into the bedroom. When I'm lying there, I can feel a pulsation. And this is what gives you the headaches, the vertigo, nausea, vomiting, disorientation. So what we've done is we say no WECS shall produce a low frequency sound to exist at between the differences between A and C weighted is more than 20. Now let me get into the C weighted. This is what you gotta do to find the infrasound. If you set that meter for A weighting, it'll ignore <laughs> all of the sound in here in the, 20 decib in the 20 hertz or lower where the infrasound is. So you have to use the meter and it has the setting so it now accepts on fair weighting to determine the noise the C level, and you can see over here, in this level here, from 20 hertz down to one, it's now accepting those amounts, those data. So now the meter can hear it. So what you do is you take the amount of the A weighting, what the meter will only look at, what the human ear hears, and determines, measures what is really there. And if that's greater than, 20 dB, it's in violation. No WCS shall produce infrasound inside any residence or place of employment with windows, doors closed. To have a peak, again, inside, you're testing inside the building. This is how this stuff is, is, is insidious. It, it penetrates through structures. So you test inside the building. So there's 6 dBA or greater using an infrasonic microphone as Mr. No Rosenblum had brought into, into the conversation earlier. And that's how we gotta deal with infrasound. Again, there's no regulation in the state of Massachusetts that has anything to do with infrasound. There are countries that use this as a weapon. You've heard about the embassies that are having all these sound waves bombed. That's infrasound. Cuba uses it. They were using experimenting with it for, so for crowd control with a high intense blast of infrasound hits people, it feels like being hit in the stomach, it actually knocks them back. Last item is shadow flicker. Again, there's no regulation anywhere in the state that, that, that has anything to do with the amount of shadow flicker somebody can, can, you can subject somebody to. This is the shadow flicker time of the year, the end of October, to somewhere in May, when the sun is low, on the sky and the, the shadow flicker comes in here where this thing passes you can see there's a shadow there you don't have to live in a home close to the turbine drive down the driftway you can see it if you can imagine being in a home and the home that's closest to it is only 600 feet away they go through that several hours a day this time of year and this is a video taken inside that home. You can see the click, click, click in the entire house. Now that may not seem like a lot to you looking at this video here with the room lights solid, but if you were in that house and the lights in the whole house would dim and go off and on, the owner's children don't want to come home from school this time of year because they can't study. It affects them and their parents. Two hours, at least. And there are other homes that are affected by this that aren't as close, but it's a shorter period of time. But it'll go through the entire winter and the spring when the sun is low and, it's, and when this thing is facing the right direction. And that's what all those provisions in here mean. Until we have a regulation that similar to this, that's gonna protect the residents of this community. They're gonna to continue to get sick. They're gonna to continue to complain. They have no alternative, unless you want them to sell their houses. I always thought that America was a country that it wasn't based upon the greater good that the Constitution talks about individual rights. And we're not just talking about one person. 
There are over 20 families that I know of. Some of them are very quiet about this because they, they're worried about the value of their property if they're going to sell. Or they're afraid of what people who think they're out of their mind are going to say if they come forward. There are people that have sold their houses and moved away very quietly because they didn't want to tell anybody that they were affected by this. And then there are other people that have taken their resources and moved their bedrooms at the back side of the house to try and get away from the thing, hiding in their own homes. I plead with the board to, to, to take some affirmative action. You, you have the power to do this. You have the responsibility to do this. You've been hearing me say this for six years, but please, there are people out there that need this. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Rosenblum? No, except I'm happy to, <clears throat> if the board has any questions, happy to try to, to answer them. I mean, this is all new to me. I mean, being just um, starting on the board a few years ago. Um, were you around when this yes. started? Um, I don't know if you have any thing, you have questions. I mean, I, I'll read through it and stuff uh, and understand it. One question I have with the flickering, and I know you, like that house you showed us, if this was facing in a, a different direction. A different, so say the blades were facing the golf course and the back was towards the right. water. You'll only you still you, see it? No, you only get it when the sun is from wherever it's turning. If the sun is if the if the, if the sun is only here when it blows in front of it. So it has an there's an omni there's an omni potential distant, uh, direction this this could be. Obviously if the sun is shining this way and the thing is facing this direction, it's not going to flicker because it's it's, it's it's 90 degrees are normal to the sun. But the minute this were this way, you'd get the flicker. But of course, if the sun moves around like this and the turbine is still in that direction, then you'll get flicker down here. Wherever the shadow is cast of that. So because the sun is moving across the sky, and of course it's higher at one time and lower, the, 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 the conditions have to be so that the sun is low and the, and the whatever direction the, the, uh, the turbine is facing will get that sun. So if the sun's coming up here, and the turbine's this direction, then you'll get shadow flicker there to a lesser degree than if the blade were this. But if the sun is out, it's somewhere. But as Mr. Rosenblum indicated, it wouldn't require, if, if, if that is the only issue that came up after drafting regulations such as this, that shadow flicker was the only annoyance. The turbine could obviously be shut down when the sun is in that particular direction and, and distance so it impacts some home. But there are many other aspects of wind turbine uh, noise and, and, and sighting that come into effect. But that, that's probably the one of the most insidious of them all, that, that click, click, click. Maybe to somebody who's in a nightclub uh, with a few drinks in them, you know, with the strobing lights going on, they, but trust me, you wouldn't want to go in any home. Is there testing going on now? Yeah, um, the selectmen uh, were very close to, uh, to uh, ordering a shutdown, but they figured it was going to cost them money and penalties from the, from the uh, turbine owner. Uh, they have the same powers as you, uh, but was there testing going on though? Were the selectmen testing? Things? So what they did is they thought they'd see if they could test and see if they could find any violations. So at the current time, they're still drafting the testing protocols, which is all of this uh, meter was speed. That testing brought on by, by you, Mr. Dyer? Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and, and the other residents. So being is affected. the testing similar to what the Board of Health did yeah, a number and, of years ago? Yeah, and I'm not very optimistic about its results because the, the state law governing the testing is still the way it was, and it's not applicable. It doesn't catch the amplitude modulation, that is the real essential part of, of the of the of the characteristics of this wind turbine that affect people the most. Yeah, I just think uh, myself with, with the selectmen in a testing situation right now is probably you know well I, I wouldn't go too far tonight anyway. Right, but then to follow up with that. Well, 
I understand that there was some talk of putting this. I don't know this if there's anybody here from the, um, from the turbine company. I don't know. I know it's a public meeting. It's, it's advertised, but they should probably be invited in if there's another meeting in the future. Maybe we can take a note of that. You have to remember that I, I understood that there's another area where they can put a second turbine in. And there was some talk among the selectmen of putting a second one in. So that's why this regulation is not only essential for the protection of what we have now, but to ensure that if they ever did decide to put a second turbine in, it's put in properly to make sure that it doesn't affect anybody. None of us that are affected have anything against the wind turbine. As a matter of fact, I love the, the look of it. But the trouble is when it wakes me up continuously, I, you know, I, and, and they feel the same way. I mean, I, I can, you have a lot of the names on that original petition that was given to you in 2012. If you need another copy of it, I can give it to you. These people have become so disappointed in the response from the town, uh, be it whether the selectmen or the Board of Health, that they've given up, but they're still affected. And when they hear I'm coming before you people, they go, rah, rah, rah. But uh, they are totally dejected. But you won't get rid of me. Oh. <laughs> I mean, the, the uh, bibliography I, I presented, uh, you know, is exhaustive. There's over 100 uh, different uh, citations there, um, and I don't expect you all to, to read every single one of them. But but it actually is a um, very nice uh, list of resources there. Now, keep in mind, this is a 2014 article, so anything more recent than there would not be listed on the bibliography. But um, yeah, that's why I provided it to you guys. So you, you you're actually on that bibliography. There's sure. So many books in there, and you took only a handful. Yeah. And most of the handful you took has a name in there. That, um, Peterson, yeah. yeah. Peterson is is uh, one of the researchers, uh, I believe, in Sweden or the Netherlands. I'm not sure actually. Um, that has done a lot of lead author on a lot of the studies, and some of them you'll notice are um, Peterson and Way, or Peterson and, and Bakker, or another researcher. Um, there are a few uh, wind turbine populations in the world that are, are generally, they're tested a lot in these studies. There's, there's ones in Netherlands and Sweden. Um, Mr. Gardy mentioned Germany. There's ones in Australia, New Zealand. Uh, there's a study in there from Maine uh, in the USA. Uh, so there are different populations around the world. But yeah, the, the, the kind of the prevalence of one particular name is because someone kind of becomes an expert in the field um, and that's what, that's what they're researching. So, but there's, there's lots of different topics. If you look at the titles of those within wind turbines, lots of different topics and within that field uh, kind of look at. Yeah. 2016, so I, as somebody who calls the Board of Health at least twice a week, the sound that you heard on that recording is minimal compared to what you listen to at a lot of nights. I mean, it is very minimal. And it just goes right through you. I mean, with the windows closed, with the windows open, it doesn't really make any difference. It's loud, very loud. And I don't think that that recording that he had, had any, did any justice to the, the, what we're trying to get through. I have also um, donated my home for sound testing. But the last testing that they did, um, six years ago or whatever, because I know that there were several um, <coughs> testing sites over at Widow Swamp Golf Course, and they were all low to the ground. And I, I, I don't know what you know, protocol is on that, but I think that those sh should be up higher because, I mean, we're, our bedrooms are upstairs, you know, and my house, it, there's an L, my bedroom window is right there, and it just magnifies into that corner of the home. And I've been there 30 years longer than that thing. So, um, and what, you know, what was the address? I'm sorry. 26 Hughes Road. Um, so I know the uh, testing we did six years ago, we kind of let the public pick where they wanted to, and worst case scenario, and everything. And I, I think uh, some of them were up high. I think some were up on Third Cliff. Uh, I, I think on the we go to your house, actually. Yeah. I think we went, we but what, up, but I don't think what Mrs. Carlberg is talking okay. about, the height where it's located on the cliff, but height above the ground. Height above the ground. 
you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, all right. I think I, I guess it, it would be up to the testing them to get a bowl they, up high. I, I, again, they can't do yeah. that because the testing by the DEP regulations and specifically says they want it six feet off the ground. You have to be 25 feet from the buildings. You have to use slow metering. They average everything. They don't take into the amplitude modulation. I mean, I think we offered that time too to piggyback on the testing because the wind turbine people paid for the testing and we let you guys run the parameter for it. The worst case scenario, but it was too bad if you could have piggybacked, you could have proven one to the other and had the microphone next to the other guy's I, microphone. I can only echo again what I said was yeah. that the testing procedures right now are protocols that the state dictates and they don't properly address this. Yeah. But this, re this regulation doesn't only take into effect the noise, but it takes into effect infrasound shadow flicker, right. two things that there isn't anything controlling it. My name is Jerry Kelly. I'm at 56 Moreland Road, and yes, testing was done in Pawnee House, but it was below the level of the house in the backyard. Uh, so it was not testing where we were hearing the sound in our bedroom. 30 feet above that, it was tested down at ground level. Uh, it did not test for amplitude modulation, it did not test for shadow flicker, and it did not test when the prevailing winds would have created a sound over in our area. Chairman Mike, to address your question, yes, you know, uh, if the sun is behind that, and if you move the industrial wind turbine, you're not going to get the shadow flicker, but you're also not going to get the power. Mm -hmm. It's going to move to face the prevailing wind in order to generate the uh, power. It is agnostic as to shadow flicker. Okay. Now, has anyone gone to, and we're talking about, like you said, with the DDP regulations, has anyone gone to them about the, you know, why are we going six and not 30? Many people, me included. I can give you copies of my letters that I've been writing registered to, to Martin Suberg, to Millie Garcia Serrano, the director of the Southeast region. Martin is the commissioner of the DEP. I've had conversations with Laurel Carlson, who was the, in that department. Had conversations with Dan DeSalvio, who's in charge of, of uh, compliance, who's right, right, right now evaluating the protocols uh, for the current testing. They're very, very adamant uh, about maintaining these protocols that are not adequate. Mr. Suberg doesn't even want to return my phone calls. He won't grant me or my colleagues or my, or my co-residents a meeting. The point being is, as long as the DEP is resistant to having an effective means of, of testing this, the, the, the noise from a turbine, and they've been over six years and they know how to do it and they haven't done it yet, obviously they're not in about any quick order to modify that. And it's, we're going to have to protect ourselves. And this board has that power and that responsibility to do that. So I ask you, we're willing to give you anything you need to research this. I'll put Mr. Rosenblum at my expense at your, at your disposal to help me research in, 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 in the legal end of it, or even the, in the technical end. His firm, Senni Associates, is, is, is very well versed, versed in this. It's about essentially about all they do. Please. I, I know it's terrible to have this thrown in your laps, but unfortunately, it's, this is the arena for it, and you, you people have that responsibility. Think about the lives you're going to help by doing something affirmative. A lot of grateful people. The other thing, if I might just add, if you don't live it, you don't get it. You know, I mean, a lot of people, you know, they, they can't understand what you listen to from 2 o'clock or 1 o'clock at night till 5 o'clock in the morning. During the day, I don't think any of us have a complaint about the whole thing. But when you hear that, it goes right through you in the middle of the night. And I would much rather listen to the North River Bell myself than that thing that just, it, 
and the, and that it pulsates. It just and it drives you absolutely out of your mind. So. Yeah, um, my name is Mark McKeever. I'm at uh, 151 Brickway. Um, you know, whether it be during the daytime or the nighttime, um, I had a lot of emails sent to the Board of Health and that we were, <coughs> you know, struggling living where we live. And, you know, currently I stopped. It, it just, it's kind of, I've given up, you know, I'm, I'm defeated, you know, my family and myself. Um, if you really want to really understand <laughs> what that thing does is come in another couple of weeks when the flicker comes. Come in my house and just sit in my living room for five minutes. And, you know, I'm not looking for any compassion or I'm sorry. I, I just, we need, something needs to be done here. And, it, and you know, it, it's, it's been six years of just torture. Absolute torture living next to that thing. And I understand it's a big responsibility for you folks and the select men. I, 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 I get it. We get it. That this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow. But just, you, you got to understand the severity. My kids, I don't sleep. My kids don't sleep. We all don't sleep. It's starting to affect us on a health line. And, and it really, I would highly recommend. If, if you have the time during the day or on the weekends, or even if you're driving by in the morning and you see the flicker when the sun's coming up, just sit there for five minutes and just take it in because it is not good. We're all part of this community. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously we, we, we bought into something more quickly than we should have. Uh, and the wind turbine, and nobody's pointing any fingers, but as a, as a, as a community, collectively, we, we, we've got to do something about this. So, <laughs> it may be a little selfish for me, because I'm impacted by it. There are many, many other people. Mm -hmm. As I said, they're really quiet out there. Some of them don't even want to tell you. And you talk about this, you know, the, the nausea and whatever. I, I relate that some people get sick and some don't affects somebody just like you go on any cruise ship and you see people vomiting over the side and another guy walking around going out to dinner it, 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 it's, it, yeah you know it's I'm an integral part of that testing. The selectmen have put me in representing the community group in, in trying to, to get the protocols so that there's a possibility that they may be able to effectively f measure the amplitude modulation for one thing. And uh, my, my, I'm, I've been butting my head against the wall with the DEP to modify their regulations so that that'll happen. And the testing firm has, has no alternative but to to test by those protocols that don't show that. And the selectmen don't want them to go outside of those protocols because if they do, and I can tell them how to set the meter so they'll see it, the DEP knows how to do that, but they won't change their mind. If they do do that and they show noncompliance, they have no leverage with the wind turbine operator. 
because he will say, oh, no, 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 that you're going against, you're not by the DEP regulations. So in essence, you know, it's a futile experiment that's going on with the current testing. He's going to have this possibly, probably have the same results as the Board of Health had back in 2013. Now, the testing protocols were just uh, firmed up, if you want to call it that. Um, and when they're scheduling the testing, it's probably going to take most of the winter if it ever occurs, because the protocols are based upon a southwest wind primarily, west, west, southwest. And those aren't the prevailing winds during the winter. So if you're going to wait on something. Yeah, problem we had before, too, and I think we were yeah. trying to do them on lunar high yeah. tides. Yeah. I think you want to snow cover. So if you're going to key your response, with all due respect to the board, based upon that, then that's only going to put this off for another year, possibly, before you will possibly take action. And my feelings are that based upon the performance we've had for six years and prior tests, and I'm telling you, there's not much different going on, and the fact that nobody's ever looked into shadow flicker or even the sighting distances that are, are too far or infrasound or amplitude modulation, all of these characteristics, I implore the board to take action at this time and, and, and do whatever you feel you have to do to research this. If nothing more, what you would be doing is be drafting a set of regulations to ensure that any future wind turbines which the town may consider putting in aren't going to cause this same part of problem to the residents. I mean, <laughs> I, I personally think, and I hope you will, you'll put the selectmen out of your mind. Plus, you're a quasi-independent organization in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You're not supposed to talk to anybody else. You're supposed to act independently. You're supposed to pretend like there's nobody else out there but yourselves. Is that true, Mr. Rosenblum? Yeah, they're doing testing, so the testing we can do is. Maybe, maybe, because definitely because at this stage of the game, there, it's been going on for the last couple of months, and it hasn't started. And, and Ideal conditions, will we ever see them? Maybe, maybe not. Well, from my side here, and, and I, I understand and I feel the pain of, you know, you guys, I don't feel that. So, like you said, I don't live it every day, um, but I am new to this. Um, I want to, and I know Wendy's new to it, I'd like to read through it, get some ideas, even go down and see, like Mr. Makiva said, you know, sit there or listen to it. Um, if it means one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, I, I don't mind. Um, and I don't know how anyone else feels, but I also think that we need to really get as a group and kind of look at this. I appreciate that. Keep one thing in mind, though. This board doesn't have to enact regulations. You've got the authority to look at this whole issue about the way this thing is affecting residents and call it a nuisance and impact health issues upon the residents of this town and shut it down. You've got, there are plenty of precedents that are set that show you have that power. And it's been done before. I'm asking you to take action. And I, I agree. And I, I the, like I said, I, the, will, I the, can't tell you tonight what my agreement is. This is all new to me. The selectman's primary goal is to manage the town and expenses. Yours is to protect the public from health issues. And this drops in your laps. Unfortunately, I hate to tell you that because you don't want to hear it, but it drops in your hands, in your laps. Please. It's just one more point of information. I'm still Jerry Kelly of 56 Moon <laughs> um, The um, uh, I was at an industry conference for the wind turbine operators. And I was... Um, I, I was like a Democrat invited to the Trump White House. I wasn't welcome. <laughs> um, uh, but I, um, 
listen to an attorney from the Sierra Club, and the Sierra Club is a ardent supporter of alternative energy. And this woman stated that there is no place for industrial wind turbines along the southeast New England coast because the density is too high and you're too close to homes. This is the Sierra Club saying this. Thank you very much for hearing us tonight. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is the downtown shut down? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Where was that located? Um, it's near, it's near Route 28. There, there's two turbines, Velmet and they're both uh, shut down.